Yeah, hello, Keith. Hello, Hannes. How are you doing? All right, man. Finally, uh, get to talk to you. And my word, uh, going through your story, um, you know, it's only when you do things like this that you tumble on these amazing stories. I never read your book, unfortunately, but I certainly will now. Um, you know, it's just an incredible saga. So, Keith, yeah, former BSAP guy, you were uniform branch, you were in CID, you worked with special branch. Um, you a lot a lot's happened in your life, and uh, it'll be good good to find out more about it. But let's just start with your family history and where you where you start off in Africa. Uh, I found that very interesting. Well, thank you, Hannes, and I, I say thank you once again for what you 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 guys do to put this history into into record. So it all started um, way back in 1880 when my great great grandfather came um, under the L London Mission Society. Um, they were the guys that financed um, David Livingston to come to to Africa. Wow. Uh, so he may have got. Um, um, interested and being directed by that society to come to South Africa to open up um, new opportunities. So his task was to um, establish a presence in a place called Pondo Land, which is on the southeast um, corner of South Africa. And uh, that's what he did. He went into Pondo Land. Invariably, that was an area which was um, primarily the Thorsas people. They are... Mm -hmm. um, the same family as Nelson Mandela. Yes. Um, so he set up a, a mission society there as a little, little mission. He couldn't speak their language. They couldn't speak English. Um, it must have been really tough for those days. But I think that uh, the word came down that uh, there was a note that was printed in the, one of the British newspapers way back then um, where they said that um, actually if uh, biscuits and, um, and gravy make the difference. So Sunday, biscuits and gravy, and everybody started coming. And that's how the the mission started. So his closest settler, if you like, people to him was uh, in Durban, which was about 300 kilometers away from where he was. Um, so they started the, the mission. They then produced some uh, children, of course. What happened was my um, great-grandfather, then they had two boys and a girl. One was uh, Cecil, the other one was Vivian, uh, and Natalie, uh, they were the children. And basically what happened was that when um, Cecil and Vivian, the two brothers, they were looking for their fortunes. So they went tearing off to uh, the west coast of, of Southern Africa. Um, at that time, it was German control. Um, it was called German Southwest Africa. And they um, had real problems because the First World War had come and uh, they were British and they were stuck in the middle of German territory. Um, Unfortunately, their horses died of starvation on the coast, um, and they only got word that they had to get the hell out of that country because of the, the German um, aggression. So they ran and walked across southern Africa to, um, to join with the military um, to go and fight in the First World War. And that was in 1814, and youngsters, they joined us. In, sorry, 1914, correct. They they joined up for the South African 1st Infantry Division. Their first job, actually, because they were horsemen and farmer boys, there was a character called Hardigan's Horse. Um, and what happened was that um, there was a huge aerial in um, what was then German Southwest Africa, um, which was capable of communicating directly with Berlin um, at that time. And the um, objective now was to rustle up a whole bunch of volunteers go across and demolish this um, this aerial, which was massive, and then uh, stop the Germans communicating with, with Berlin so that the uh, South Africans could take over Namibia, what, what is now Namibia. And that's what they did. They rustled up 124 men, went across there with horses, went up and um, demolished the whole place. From there, they rejoined the South African 1st um, Infantry Division that went up to... Um, to Egypt, and there they fought with um, one of the local uprising characters. It was I don't want to go too much into that story. It takes too long, um, which they defeated. The South Africans uh, defeated them. And then from there, they went by ship to Marseille in uh, France and then up into the, the Somme, where they 
both ended up in uh, the Battle of Delville Wood. Hmm. And um, they, um, it was a short, sharp battle of about five days. Um, only very few of the people that actually, um, the soldiers that went into that battle came out alive, either um, most of them wounded. Um, both Cecil and Vivian were wounded several times in that battle. And um, what's interesting is that the um, only more recently, you had a special branch um, member that was interviewed by you um, called Hans Sittach. And in communication with Hans, we found out that um, Hans's grandfather had been at that battle as well, but on the German side. <laughs> and um, what had taken place was that uh, during the battle, there were trenches, um, and um, both my grandfather and his brother Vivian were um, Lewis gun um, operators, so they were machine gunners, and um, because of their, their size, really. And um, they were the east flank was being um, hammered, and um, they were instructed to go across and to support that flank. What had happened was that they had run out of ammunition, so. Um, Cecil, my grandfather, was um, instructed to run across uh, and get more magazines for the machine gun. These are round uh, things which clip onto the top of the machine gun. Anyway, there was no, no way he was going to get through the trenches. There were so many dead bodies and um, so much carnage, if you like, uh, in that area that he ran across the front um, as fast as he could. Um, he got an injury through the eye, um, but he continued and he grabbed a whole bunch of magazines, came back. Um, across the front of the trenches again, um, joined his brother, and then they opened fire on a huge wave of Germans, which Hans's grandfather was part of. According to what um, my my grandfather wrote in his notes, was that it was um, an absolute um, bloody battle. Yeah, so they mowed down thousands, or well, not thousands, but probably hundreds of Germans, which was horrible. So anyway, they were wounded several times. They were withdrawn, and they didn't fight anymore because of their injuries. They were withdrawn, and that was the end of the, their commitment to the First World War activities. One interesting thing was when, he, when my grandfather was in, in Egypt, he was um, injured by a, um, a Turkish bullet, and he was so angry. After the war, he said, doesn't mind being shot by Germans, but not by Turks. And um, he was rather <laughs> upset about that. So, um, and when I asked him about uh, his his um, activities during the Battle of Delville Wood, the only word that he said to me was, it was cold. So you, you only learn about these things later, um, how tough it was in those days for those guys. So that was the uh, story of my grandfather. Um, and I need to go back, uh, his sister, Natalie, uh, married a chap called Captain um, John Taylor. Now, what happened with Taylor in 1896, um, Cecil John Rhodes urgently needed to send up additional support troops to um, what was then Salisbury because of the um, local people rebelling, the Mashona and Matabili Rebellion of 1896. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so... There was a bunch of characters in mainly Durban, Peter Maritzburg area of South Africa, gathered together volunteers, thrown up um, as and called Natal Troop. And Natal Troop, half of them sailed up um, to Mozambique via Baira, trekked across into um, into what was called Salisbury. Um, mm -hmm. And Taylor, together with another 50-odd um, soldiers, went up by Oxwagon as fast as they could to meet up with uh, his other half of group in Salisbury, but they they were supposed to end up in another place and they got called because the Mashonas were now rebelling and they all got to Salisbury eventually. And um, they did a lot of actions there. And um, uh, he was a captain of the Natal troop and they were the main support group, if you like, that supported the, um, the local people of Salisbury uh, at that time in what was called a lager, the Salisbury lager. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of uh, running around um, trying to stop this rebellion. One of them was where they um, they went to a place called um, Chishawasha um, Mission, and they saved mm -hmm. a lot of um, missionaries there and brought them back. And in fact, the, those missionaries didn't want to leave the mission. But uh, because of the incidents of murder and um, atrocities that were taking place, they realized that they had to. And um, the Natal troop went in there 
grabbed him and pulled him out. And um, they had a lot of fighting on the way back. A number of the, the troop were shot and killed. Uh, there was a character there called Lion Stevens. Um, he had wrestled with a lion one stage and managed to kill it, but he was also shot in that um, in a number of the uh, uh, battles that took place on the return. And yeah. then um, the missionaries uh, thanked them. Uh, they wrote a lot of letters of thank you to the Natal troop, and also to they gave them a nice um, map which they had drawn, which we gave to the archives in um, in what is now Harare. Um, and then that uh, after that rebellion, the uh, Natal troop was disbanded. Uh, many of the people went back to South Africa, but some some of them stayed on in uh, um, in Rhodesia after that. Keith, I just want to my... I just want to butt in there. It's interesting what you say about Chishawasha, uh, because that's where I used to live, uh, very close oh. by. So you know, I always took a took a bit of an interest in the mission, and then um, I went to see. Uh, I went on a tour of Kruderskill about 15, 16 years ago when it was still open. You could go on guided tours. And what was very interesting is in Rhodes' bedroom, and, you know, the rest of the house is beautifully decorated and quite opulent, but his bedroom was actually very sparsely furnished. Um, and it sort of gave you an insight to the man. And his bed was just a very simple steel bed in the corner of the room. And all there was above it was a black and white photograph of Chishawasha Mission. Wow. Above his bed. And apparently, you know, he actually financed Chishawasha Mission. Uh, Rhodes gave them quite a lot of money to get the mission going. And it's just ironic, you know, when you when you look back on history, Rhodes today is vilified as, um, as something of a colonial monster. But um, this was the sort of thing he did. Um, he was trying to help these missionaries. And and the irony is, as you probably know from your war days, Chishawasha actually became quite a hotbed for political dissenters. And a lot of the recruiting for the chaps who went off to fight against us took place at Chishawasha Mission. So there was a facility that probably only came into being thanks to Rhodes, it was saved by, those missionaries were saved by your uh, for for forefathers, um, and then you know it became a very anti anti uh, yes anti white put it that way establishment. But uh, you know that's just my little bit on Chishawasha. But but now you carry on with uh, with your grandfather. So that's oh. over, and and they decide that's, to stay. They did, but he died a year later. Um, we don't know how. Um, we've been trying to find out, but we didn't. Um, find out the reason for his death. But um, yeah, it's the, the progression of um, the Chisnels, if you like, from that came from those that combination. So my father was the result of the marriage between those people. And then he um, actually, now they had settled in, sorry, let me just go back. He had, They had settled in, in Rhodesia. Um, my grandfather, after the war, had become a surveyor. And um, he was the guy that surveyed the original um, bowling green at Mazoe, um <laughs> Citrus Estate, for example. Um, so they settled in, in the country. Most of them were farmers because that was what was most commonly uh, done. Good farming land, Rhodesia was. Dad was born, plus two brothers, and um, they grew up as farmers. And then, of course, the Second World War came, and um, they all served in that war, uh, all the brothers. My, my father and his two brothers. Um, my um, father was in 237 um, Squadron um, with, uh, originally they, they trained in Harvards and then into Hurricanes and then into Spitfires. And he served in in, um, in Egypt and then also in Italy. So, um, and his brother, um, Tony, Tony Chisnell, he was a um, bomber pilot operating from England, basically. And uh, the one particular time, um, Tony was uh, flying back from a raid that had taken place in France, and uh, the aircraft was um, so badly shot up that they ditched into the English Channel. And um, the Americans um, uh, responded with a Catalina uh, to come and rescue them. Now, there was eight people in that aircraft when they came, and a Catalina aircraft would be able to land 
on the sea um, and uh, collect the survivors of that um, that bomber crash. And um, when they came down, they hit a wave, an odd wave, and the aircraft just broke up. So eight people in that Catalina died. The Americans died, saving Tony and his friends. Um, fortunately, they, they sent another one, and uh, they were able to um, extract them. So... To his death day, <laughs> to... Tony was very upset about that, that he had, um, he, he always put himself at blame that he had cost the lives of eight Americans sure. um, aircraft. Yeah. B-37 squadron was, was Ian Smith's squadron, I think. Correct, yeah. So he would have, yeah. he, he would have actually flown with Ian Smith. It's possible. He never really talked about it much. Um, I think um, that was, my father's name was Ted Chisnell. He, um, I don't think, was the best of pilots. <laughs> From his logbook, you could see average, average, average. Um, in fact, he had um, been shot down and or crashed eight times during the war. Um, and eventually they said to him, pack it up and you're not good enough and go. <laughs> so he went back to Cranbourne and became an instructor So until the end of the war. And then from there, farming again. Um, my father, when he came back from, from the war in... Um, in Europe, um, met my mother um, on one of the ships coming out um, from from England, and uh, that's how they met up. And they went farming. Funny enough, um, on my mother's side, my grandmother was um, operating uh, an anti aircraft gun in the Women's Voluntary Service in England, and uh, she was based at a place called Salisbury, which is just south of London, and. Um, my mother was um, removed from uh, that area by the local authorities and all the children were put into safekeeping away from the towns because of the German bombing. But my gran on my mother's side, um, she once shot down one of these Heinkels, you see, and the Americans came rushing around the next day to give her all the, um, the, the machine guns from that aircraft. And they said, well, that's normal. You know, you get given these um, as a, as a token gift for you bringing down the aircraft, but that was grand. <laughs> you know, Keith, so, uh, hearing you tell these stories about about um, your father and uncle just, uh, again, brings me to the present, the, the coronation coming up, and the one country that will not be seen or represented is, uh, is, is, is Rhodesia. Um, and it's just... Uh, on the one hand, it makes me angry, but uh, it's just a reminder that uh, people have got very short memories. When yes. you look at, at the commitment that was shown by the people from that country and the yeah. way they've been treated, uh, no matter what happened politically, uh, I just think it says a lot more about, about the British than it does about us. And I have this argument with people quite frequently, and I'd like saying, well, we should petition the Brits uh, to be allowed to to appear and and my view is i don't i don't agree with that i think we should we should be proud to be alone uh, we know what we did and they know what what happened and um if they want to be this small minded then as i say that says more about them than it does about us but um right. that's just that's just my little my little bit so so now your yeah. your father goes farming in the in, in the sonoya area Correct. Just, just going back to that story that you've mm -hmm. just narrated, uh, um, it also affects me um, in the sense that um, all my relatives served um, on the Allies side, the British side, uh, in both wars. Um, mm -hmm. And um, the, the mere fact that at least 10% of the Rhodesian population um, took active participation in the mm -hmm. First World War and a similar figure in the Second World War was meant that the that country, Rhodesia, donated more men and more per, uh, women to the um, activities of the First and Second World War than any other colony. Per capita, yeah, that's right, as a, as, a, as a percentage. I think in the Second World War, they had to actually stop the volunteers because they were concerned <laughs> that there wouldn't be yeah. enough enough men left in the, in the what was then the colony. So, yeah, I know, it is it's quite incredible yeah. um, how vindictive the British have been. Uh, about this whole thing. It's an uh, absolute disgrace, right. but uh, it's something they've got to live with. I think we can hold our heads yeah. up high. Um, if they can, well, they've got a different view of the world to the one I have. That's it, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's more or less 
a brief summar summary and, and bringing the family up to date before um, our problems in Rhodesia from the 70s and so on. So that's where we come from. So I'm a third generation Rhodesian, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, to bring you from there, we, you see, my father uh, and my mother um, went farming in the Bankett area. But then as a manager, my dad was a manager there, but then um, things were better and prices were good for goods being produced. So they went and bought a farm in Sonoya. It's about 10 or 12 miles from Sonoya, which is kind of like north of um, Harare. And um, that's where we, 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 we were basically born there, my sister and I. And we had a, another sister. Unfortunately, she died when she was rather young. But um, Trish, my sister, and I were born, brought up there. We went to um, Sonoya Primary School and Sonoya High School. And on the farm, we used to farm um, several hundred cattle, uh, maize, of course. Tobacco was a big income. Um, wheat, uh, which was winter wheat, soybeans, peanuts, you name it, we, we grew it. And we had around about um, 6,000 acres. Um, but times changed because the weather was changing now and then. And then we ended up being a little bit poor. So dad had to send, sell off half the farm um, to the bosuns. And they um, they took over half of our farm uh, so we could survive. And um, uh, we continued like that. But eventually, um, the... Uh, the weather of four years of drought took us out. Uh, we had no irrigation, um, and we had to sell the farm and uh, and move. You know, so we end, ended up moving into Kariba. Um, my father and mother ended up uh, being the um, the main operators for the United Touring Company in okay. in Kariba, and okay. that's. Um, that's that story. So Sonoya was um, a very, very good rural school, if you like. We had a few day scholars, which were um, the people that came from homes in the town. But most of us were farming boys and girls. And um, the school still stands very proud um, with a number of uh, people that actually went into um, into the wars that we're talking about now. Um, so, yeah, good school. And at boarding school, you got a hint of the of the war coming. Uh, Keith, yeah. you guys had to start um, taking precautions in the hostels. and That's right. Actually, you're right, Hannes. I forgot about that. In the primary school, um, there was a, a really tough time. I remember um, the first battle, major battle of, of the what was called mm -hmm. the Second Chim Chimaringa War mm -hmm. uh, took place. And um, that was when seven um, insurgents were... Um, were killed in what was called the Battle of Sonoya. Um, my father was involved in that. He was a uh, section com uh, leader. And um, I remember my sister was so upset because she saw him taking off in the helicopter and going to get to deployed into fighting these um, insurgents. All of them were killed. None of our people were killed. Um, but I understood, and we haven't confirmed it, but there was apparently a police tracker dog that was shot during that that battle. But at that time, uh, the school was um, in a nervous kind of condition and the farmers in that area. So the school at Sonoya Primary School was boarded up um, and, and barricades were put up. Uh, we had sandbags at almost every um, entrance and we had a huge big diamond mesh um, fence put around us. And then vivid memory that when we used to go to bed at night, we would have to put boards up against the windows um, with a nail, keep the board up against the window to stop any possibility of people throwing grenades through the windows. So for us as youngsters of that, that time, it was very, very um, unsettling. We mm -hmm. had no clue what was going on. We didn't understand any of this, but that was what we had to do. So we did it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So the, the Sonoya Primary School was at one stage a um, little barricaded place where some of the farmers and their wives and children came and were boarded. You know, they were put into into this lager, if you like, at that time. Yeah. And then Sonoya High, uh, you produced some good rugby players. Uh, Keith, I remember the yeah, first... Yeah, before you finished with Sonoya Primary, at that time, mm -hmm. we had a, one of the families that was killed in that area was the Fuyun family. Yes, that's right. And they were just... They were just gentle folks farming, minding their own business, employing local people and running their farm the best way they can. And their daughter was Nicolette, and uh, she was in my class. And I remember we we were allowed to watch television for half an hour. 
um, black and white television. Um, and um, the news came up and we were allowed to watch the news. And they said that um, the Falunes had been murdered. And uh, we didn't put one, two together. We didn't really understand much. We were still young. But the next day, um, Nicolette um, was in class and her grandmother came down and picked her up. And she had to take a little brown suitcase and leave. And her parents had been shot. And um, it was terrible for us as youngsters. We didn't understand what, but we had heard that they'd been murdered. And uh, it was horrible. So, yeah, a lot of incidents there. Um, some of the farmers got involved with some actions with the um, insurgents and the um, the stories of young guys being um, in a position where they were being chased or shot at um, as young boys on the farms. So a number of those things happened during that period. So we started to um, have to bolster our security on the farm and at school. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was a big problem at, at high school. Um, nothing really was, um, it had settled down a little bit as far as the security was concerned for the high school side. Mm -hmm. But uh, the high school was um, was good, a good school. We had um, um, all the sports facilities. Um, most of it was uh, financed by the government, but we it was augmented by the um, donations made by local farmers and the uh, parents of mm -hmm. pupils from the school helped to make that school what it was. Yeah. Every year, they um, at a later stage, when we got to being seniors, um, we'd have a delegation of police and the, and the army and the air force, and they would come and set up in a school hall, and then um, ask for volunteers who were leaving the school. All the seniors would then have to choose as to what they're going to do. Um, now, at that time, I wanted to be um, a um, game ranger. That was my passion. I wanted to be in the bush. And um, my father said to me, well, you have to complete three years of police training or the equivalent in farming. So I had to do national service anyway, which I think at that time was a year. Uh, so I thought, well, let me just do three years of police. And then after that, I can go and become a game ranger. And uh, so I joined up in the British South Africa police. And uh, that was in December 1974. My father dropped me off. Um, I'd, I'd, been, I'd just left school about 21 days later. I was on the parade ground in, in uh, Morris Depot in Salisbury, the police training depot. And uh, I joined what was 8 Squad 1974. And we had a further squad there called 7 Squad. And a number of squads called the National Service Squads. Um, were also there, but I was a regular. But at that time, I was only 17 years old, so I couldn't become a fully-fledged policeman. I had to actually become a cadet. But because my birthday was just before we were going to pass out in March, um, then I was allowed to to stay with the squad, and then I became a fully-fledged uh, one-bar police officer when we completed that training um, in Morris Depot. And, so your, we and did... your first posting... Keith? Yeah, what happened was that um, at that time, again, you get um, up to the officers and then you're going to a line and they say, right, what's your name and rank? And, um, you know, where would you like to go and your, your position? Where would you like to be posted, if you like, after the police training? And, of course, everybody had heard about the war in um, Operation Hurricane and Centenary and Mount Darwin. Nobody wanted to go there. Everybody wanted the cushy jobs <laughs> in town. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, they said, what's your name? I said, Pio Chisnall. And they said, right, centenary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I had to rush off and um, uh, we got up to centenary. Uh, and I was all nervous, but we had done our, our, our coin training in the police. Um, we'd, we'd become experts at uh, rifles and all our police duties, and we became uh, a little bit more confident. But of course, it was nerve-wracking. It was the unknown. We didn't know what was going on. And um, getting to Centenary was a um, really um, an exciting time for me. Um, when I arrived there, um, we had um, Inspector Cassidy was our member in charge. And um, at the, we also had, in front of the, the main police station, was um, a huge number of South African police. They were there until um, August of 1975 when they were pulled out. And, of course, 
um, the airstrip that was part of Centenary was right in front of our um, our house, the, the patrol officer's house, which was a three-bedroom house, and we overlooked the, um, the airstrip. And one of our tasks was actually to make sure that the quantity and the quality of the uh, Jet A1 um, fuel for the um, Air Force was was correct, and we'd have to send in reports to Mount Darwin um, to give them information that everything was how much fuel we had for the helicopters, uh, for the Army and the Air Force in Centenary, and um, much of the the battles that took place really started. Um, a little bit later, much uh, the air the air force and fire force um, sections were relocated to Mount Darwin, so Centenary mm -hmm. became a bit of a dull um, airstrip. Uh, although we did have uh, people come there every now and then, the air force, but uh, primarily Mount Darwin became the centre of um, yeah. of that operation originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the police section there um, at that time was. Primarily, in, I was involved in uniform branch duties, which involved all crimes uh, from murder and um, strange things such as bestiality. We arrested a guy once for that. Um, and um, many incidents uh, that took place and many stories relating to um, to crime. Um, we were responsible. We would normally go out uh, on a crime scene, um, either myself and a sergeant or myself and a, a constable. They would be black, and uh, we'd go out and investigate the crime. If it was a large crime, we would hand that across to the CID. For example, on one occasion, we came across eight bodies. The entire crawl had been murdered, and uh, this was just too big for us, so we handed that straight across to CID. But uh, other murders we handled, um, and uh, theft, and general maintenance of law and order. We were also responsible for um, things, silly little things, like, for example, in the those days, you had to have a permit to trans um, to have cattle walk next to the road uh, from one place to another, things like that. So you would author authorize that and um, checking vehicles and and all the right stuff. So and, mundane and stuff. Pun yeah. Punch ups, punch ups in the pub at Mount Darwin. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it was Centenary, but Centenary's oh, Country you. Club was renowned for. Um, characters um, coming in there and spending too much time then i guess too much money um they would go and have a, a round of golf around the the golf course and an hour or two and then come down to the 19th hole as they call it and the the pub was always full of of local farmers and that's where we got to know uh, many of these farmers uh, and the the characters that were there um there was an incident uh, once with a guy called angus mctavish now angus was uh, um, quite a shortish guy, um, and he'd hung on too long in the pub, and um, <laughs> it was time for him to go home. Everybody had switched off the lights, and now Angus had to go. But what happened was halfway home, his his journey home was considerable distance. It was probably 30 kilometers. He was based right down. He had a farm right down in the southeast corner of the Centenary uh, Police area on the border with Chueshi Tribal Trust Land. Mm -hmm. Anyway, his vehicle drove, uh, traveling along and he broke down. And uh, now he had to get back home because his wife was waiting for him. So he decided that he's going to walk the rest of the way. But at that time, of course, everybody, all the farmers were quite nervous. And along the road, there were farms next to that uh, road. And um, McTavish decided that he was going to identify himself um, by singing very loudly. Um, and that would indicate that he was a local farmer and that nobody would shoot him. So he sang his song, I'm Angus McTavish, all the way back down to the farm. <laughs> when he got there, his wife obviously opened the door. And at that point, he, he wished he hadn't been <laughs> Angus McTavish. <laughs> so real character. Uh, so yeah, we had, there were two farmers there that hated each other's guts. Whenever they, um, they uh, got to meet each other at the, the pub, there would be a fight. And... Um, so we all invariably ended up getting to arrest one or two of them uh, together and put them in different cells for the night, but they were constantly <laughs> each other's throats. And I recall that there was um, a system, which you've discussed this before, called the Agric Alert. All the farmers had a radio system with alarms, which was monitored by us in the police um, charge office. And um, the Agric Alert went off one night and we 
we um, got activated and uh, we put on our kit. We were ready to to go to react to this um, this alarm. And there had been a, one particular farm had been attacked, and it was actually one of these two people that had hated each other. It set off the agric alert. But what had happened was that the the other farmer who hated this guy had attacked the farm like a terrorist attack, you know. <laughs> Jesus. And um, that particular farmer had um, POMS Z grenades placed all around his property um, and flares and all sorts of things as a form of defense. And he had two huge Bouvier de Flanders dogs. And anyway, it was a full-on war, basically. And this farmer set off all his um, his grenades around to protect himself, and he didn't know who was attacking him. And um, half the farmhouse burnt down because of this, because they oh. placed them too close to the thatch. And yeah, it was a whole story, but um, uh, they were real characters. Uh, and in fact, we got on very well with both of them, but they never, never became friends, and they hated each other forever. Um, One of the uh, the characters, um, which we will come to later, um, was Vernon Price. He was uh, yes. one of the big um, and, farmers. And, in and Vernon's stepson was Mark McNulty, who, right. who learned his game on, on that golf course and went on to become one of the great one of the great golfers of his day. So, Perfect, yeah. yeah. Because his mother, uh, Moira, um, I remember that there was a story that uh, Mark had been doing very well in the international golfing circuit and um, – that his mother Moira, um, he came back home and his ratings dropped. And I remember being with Vernon and Moira um, Price on the farm, and we were just having some cup of tea and catching up. And Mark pitched up, and Moira laid into him physically, um, and said, "You're an idiot because you're not um, you're not playing properly, and you're just resting on your laurels." So, funny enough, his his um, standing on the international market, uh, um, the you. golfing circuit, actually. Proved for a while. <laughs> so yeah, they were real characters. Yeah, yeah. Vernon uh, Vernon had a squash board there. We, we used to often go and play squash there with him on the farm. Keith, then you started moving towards Mount Darwin and started operating down in the Zambezi Valley, and things started. Yeah, no, what, the second farm that was attacked in the Centenary area uh, with the um, unfortunate presence of a chap called Mark uh, de Bourgrave. Was a farm called Whistlefield Farm. Yes. At that time, um, Whistlefield Farm was midway in the, in the um, police jurisdiction of Centenary and uh, right in the center. And um, I had been moved from Uniform Branch to what was called ground coverage. My job had now changed from general crime um, attendance to now um, information gathering about um, insurgents in the Centenary farming area. So they, we relocated um, together with a number of um, support staff from the police to Whistlefield Farm. We took over an old management um, farmhouse, and uh, that's where we operated from. So our job was to actually collect information on um, possible groups of insurgents in the area. Mm -hmm. And we were quite successful. Um, one of the chaps that we had there was a chap called Jenna, Constable Jenna. He was so... Um, mild and meek, but very aggressive when it came to actually um, handling and dealing with um, insurgents. One of the things that took place was that we got information about a very big group, and we called them um, the football club, and um, we put Jenna into a 45-gallon uh, drum on the back of a tr tractor trailer, and all the locals went to the football match on the farm um, on that tractor, and um, Jenna was secretly hidden inside this 45 gallon drum which was common because you needed diesel to go and support the tractor but this this drum was empty and jenna was sitting in there with a pistol and a radio and his job was we had drilled a couple of holes around the the drill the, the, the drum and his job was to to monitor what was going on at the football match and this group of terrorists um pitching up there um, so that's really, that worked well. And, um, but when we got him out, I don't think he could walk for about half an hour. He was so cramped in that little hole, but yeah, that particular group actually almost to a man got annihilated. Um, so just talk uh, us through the incident. He, he, what he overheard, uh, people talking yeah, about the we group. Got the information. 
yeah, they were there. He had bad visual, so we couldn't actually um, confirm, and we didn't have the troops at that time to react to that. So it was basically a, a, um, a an attempt to get more information and to find out how many of these characters were there. So that particular group, um, it was not too long after this that um, some tracks were found a bit north of Whistlefield, going north towards the Zambezi Valley and over the Vuradona Mountains. So we we put a um, a part two stick, which is a police af, uh, anti-terrorist unit, uh, generally six six farmers put together, and put them on the tracks with our uh, local tracker, who was called Sam. He was remarkable; he could track anything. Um, and they followed the tracks, and we realized that these the football gang, as we call them, were on their way down from the farming area over the Mvuradona Mountains towards the Zambezi Valley. There was a big river there and um, uh, going down the hills. So we could predict that they were going to follow this this river through the gorge down to the, the base. So we hurriedly rushed at high speed a couple of uh, party units all the way down to the Zambezi Valley, all the way around, and they had to literally run to, the, to get to the mouth of where that river came down from the Mvuradona Mountains. Uh, well, to act as a stop the, group. Probably the Musugezi. No, it wasn't the Musugezi. The Musugezi okay. was to the west of that. Oh, okay. But it was it was actually what is called Saw Falls. Um, okay. In my book, uh, Watch My Tracer, you'll you'll find the pictures there of the okay. Saw Falls. Those beautiful waterfalls there, ice cold water in the middle of the heat of the Zambezi Valley. But the thing was that the the follow up troop under Sam the Tracker. I mean, they were literally running on the tracks. Um, and Sam said that this is a very large group, um, so they had to be very careful. But the farmers were well-trained under police anti-terrorist unit. They were well-trained, well-armed, and they caught these uh, this group in that particular valley. And a firefight ensued, and um, they killed 36. So um, a year later, I actually walked down there to go and see if I could pick up any weapons that had been left behind by that um, by that group, but we found nothing. But what a remarkable um, uh, opportunity that the, that group uh, of six men took out 36. And uh, it was one of the biggest culls at that time in that area. So it was good. Keith, um, and then and then you get uh, shunted down to Gutsa, where, yeah. you, where you, yeah. you, you're on your own. So we had a, yeah, we had a, if you go to Centenary um, in the farming area there, as we talked about, the Mvuradona Mountains are on the northern side of that, and they act as basically an escarpment. If you go over those mountains and down into the Zambezi Valley, that is part of the, an extension, if you like, of the Great Rift Valley, and the Zambezi River runs through that. The Msingezi, as you mentioned, is one of the rivers that we were on uh, in the Centenary area down in the Zambezi Valley. Now, there was a, um, a police a patrol officer there. His name was Harry Edwards. Um, he was down in a place called Gutsa. And Gutsa was essentially an old internal affairs um, house, which was dilapidated and not used. So I pitched there um, in my private car because you weren't allowed to take a vehicle down there. I didn't have a, a police vehicle at that time. I had my own car. And it was an Alpha. Drove down the escarpment at high speed uh, <laughs> because there's there's just a dirt road in those days, um, and you you've got to get down there because it's a long way, and you don't want to be caught at night. So, got down there. Um, eventually, found Goods uh, Camp. It was a well disguised <laughs> little house, um, but that's where the police station was, and it was right next door to Chief Goods's um, residence or crawl. And the house had no electricity, um, no fridges or of any na nature. We had two um, fuel bowsers. One of them was for diesel and one for petrol. Um, we had petrol uh, vehicle down there at Land Rover. And the diesel was really there for the internal affairs and also for the military, the army, to, to get um, supply should they need it. And, of course, we had to keep track of that. Uh, so Gutsa was a, a very, very rough um, place. We were the only police station, if you can call it, it was a sub-police station. Um, 
in the that whole area from uh, the centenary farming area right through until the Zambezi River, um, going left to Mvukwi's side, which was 60, 70 kilometers away, right through to the Mount Darwin side. So probably um, 50 kilometers either way. Uh, it was huge for us to control. And we had about 240,000 people down there, um, local residents who were running um, their own lives on farms, um, and uh, we were responsible for the basic running of that police station in the sense of crime, monitoring of um, terrorist in, or insurgent uh, incursions into the area. So our jobs were very, very um, demanding. Yeah. We had a lot of uh, responsibilities. Um, we were fortunate at that time because uh, I was only supported by one regular police um, sergeant a police reservist, a black police reservist, and a national white national serviceman. Um, and that's basically our camp, and that's what we had. We had no defenses, really. We had a few sandbag places, but if they attacked us, we would have been in trouble. But um, at that particular time, uh, unbeknown to us as local policemen, we didn't know um, why there wasn't that much terrorist activity or insurgent activity in that area at that time. We were not picking up too much information. And what was happening was that there was big um, problems in Zambia. Zipra and Zanla were fighting each other. Um, and this story will come la up later when we discuss another unit that I was involved with. Uh, but the, the two factions were fighting each other and the Zambian police were getting involved and that sort of stopped the migration or the move of, of mm. insurgents into the centenary area. So we didn't have too much activity there. It did pick up a little bit later, and we had a lot of um, um, incidents a little bit later on in, after my time in, in that Gutsa area. During that time, when Gutsa was not good enough, it was really a, uh, a very stressful time as far as security was concerned. We had no facilities, and uh, the government decided to install and build a new police station called Mzarabani. And um, I remember there was an Italian guy there called Bruno, who rushed around getting his men to build Zarabani police station with all haste because he wanted to get the hell out of that hot Zambezi area. And um, Zarabani was built right at the foot of the um, Vuridona Mountains as it's, if you come down from Centenary and you get down to the Zambezi Valley, I look on your right and that's a Zarabani police station. At that time, this police station was built out of wood uh, wooden cabins, if you like, there was no um, defense, really. So when we took possession of that camp, our first job was to increase our defense cap capabilities. So we went down to the river on an almost daily basis to get rocks, and we financed the cement through sales of beer that we had a pub there, and we <laughs> built a huge, big six-foot wall around this this camp, which was quite a thing, and we had pool boxes on the sides and so on like that. So it, was, it increased our defense capability because we were so close to the Buridana mountains that um, anybody with a, a mortar would have taken us out. So we had to increase our um, mm. defenses there, but we continued our, our policing there. And at that time also, there was a big move by the um, government good hearts to try and incre increase the work opportunities down in the Zambezi Valley. And um, right next door, they set up a place called Tilko. Now Tilko, mm was um, uh, an opportunity to develop farming area. And, and that particular area of the Zambezi Valley, it was to do with employing local people in the Zambezi Valley for the production of cotton. Okay. Um, so a vast stretch of area was flattened by bulldozers and um, cotton fields were planted there. But at the same time, we had a problem because now the government decided that um, they were going to put all the local people people in that area, as well as other parts of Rhodesia, into what was called protected villages. And um, 240,000 people were moved from the rural areas into these protected areas, which were um, guarded by internal affairs and guard force people. And um, all the information and our liaison with the local people and the chiefs that we were doing prior to that was very, very um, uh, good. Our our relationships there was 
top notch. We had anybody saw somebody with a, a banana shaped um, weapon would come to to our police station or call us, and we would go to them, and uh, we had good relations. The minute the protected villages were put into place, that information dried up, and um, the locals began to. Uh, um, so it was come really not. Um, yeah, it, it didn't help us in the slightest as far as hearts and minds were concerned. But be as it may, that's what what what, what took place. Um, I'd been there a while. Yeah, sorry, Keith uh, Peter Beck. Uh, yeah. Um, what was the story there with his? Uh, Peter Beck was um, also part of um, the police. He was um, trained shortly after me. Say a junior man. He'll hate me saying that, but um, he was transferred to Centenary. And um, what had happened was a group of um, insurgents had come in. I think there were seven. And uh, what had happened was that they had come to the farm, one of the farm house, uh, farms, and um, the farmer was busy paying the local uh, his local uh, employees and um, sitting at a desk paying the, the people for their, their work. Uh, the farmers there also not only paid the, the the local people, but they also gave them rations um, such as meat and general maize to eat on a weekly basis. So they looked after their people. And this group of seven uh, insurgents pitched up there at this date and time because of the, the pay, you see. So we imagined that it was going to be a robbery after investigation. But what happened was it was very confusing. These seven came and faced the farmer and um, um, obviously took the money from him and the, the, the farm neighbors didn't get paid. But then suddenly a loud explosion occurred and one of the um, insurgents had fired an RPG-2 um, into the body of one of the insurgents that was standing right next door to the farmer. Both the, that insurgent who was the leader of that group and the farmer were killed in that blast. And then they took off. Um, so we got a report, uh, well, not we, Peter Beck got the report. So he reacted and I was there as well. And we we, we pulled in and um, it was a, a, a terrible scene. Everything was in such a shambles. So this group had bombshell dead, disappeared. And we tried to follow tracks and uh, we couldn't locate them after a while. But over the next week, we actually captured every single one of those men. Um, and uh, one of those instances was we were driving down. Uh, Peter was coming to visit me down in the Zambezi Valley um, at Mzarabani. But uh, we were traveling together in a Land Rover. And um, a local black chap waved us down. So we stopped. And he said, be careful. There's a, a terrorist just down the road. And um, we asked him to, to accompany us. And he said, no, he's not interested. He was very scared, so we asked him to show us exactly where. And just up the where we had passed was a big yellow roads department truck, because at that time they were building a tar road from Centenary all the way down the valley to, to Mzarabani, so you didn't have to drive on dirt anymore. You could drive on a tar road. So they had this big yellow truck there. So we decided if the terrorists saw us coming down in the um, police vehicle, they're going to either ambush us or – just be quiet. So we decided we're going to go clandestine. We jumped in the back of this this big yellow um, vehicle and uh, got the driver, who was nervous as hell, to drive down. And at the, the given point, he would bash the back of the cab to tell us to debus. And so we leapt from the back of this huge truck um, and rushed into the bush and, and found this one terrorist there. He was completely stark naked. And um, so we arrested him and eventually got to find his weapons and stuff. But because we were only two people, we had to be very aware of what was going on. So we had to keep our, our weapons at, at hand. We thought maybe it was going to be an ambush. Um, so we tied a rope around his neck uh, and to Peter's belt. Um, anyway, when he got back and eventually was um, brought up for um, for murder of the farm, farmer, um, he faced... Peter Beck's, I think it was his uncle, uh, Justice Beck. Yes, he was a judge, that's right. That's right. And so um, Peter was called in as um, as the accused. Uh, one of the things that the terrorists said was that we had beaten him, and uh, that was totally uh, incorrect, and that we were going to hang him, and it was only because we wanted to keep him tethered 
during this this troubled time that we actually put the rope around his neck. There was no other place to put it. You, where are you going to put the rope around? He's got no clothes on. So anyway, that was all thrown out, but um, it caused a little bit of strife because, you know, how fair the, the judicial system in, in Rhodesia was at that time was that they took that accusation seriously. And then mm -hmm. Peter Beck was then basically going to be accused of beating him up or me. And um, But in fact, it was investigated. So it wasn't... Yes. It was uh, it was properly done, you know. Justice mm -hmm. was proper, and uh, right was right, and wrong was wrong, and mm -hmm. so that was all. So, but over that period of time, we, as I say, we basically um, arrested and captured all of those guys, and they all went to jail and were hung for their their uh, their deeds. But what we found out: why did that guy actually fire that RPG two into the one one of his mm -hmm. colleagues or mm -hmm. his leader? was that um, they hated each other. And that particular uh, insurgent had, had killed his leader because he hated him. And that's why that took place. It just happened to be that the farmer was there next to him, yes. uh, that he got killed. Heath, yeah. um, then you started going, you started operating in a pseudo role and, uh, and uh, started and, working uh, with Colin Evans. Am I jumping the gun a bit? Just a little bit. I just wanted to tell you a story about... Uh, um, the Bultong tree. Yes. Down there in in the Zambezi Valley, you know, we were at Mzarabani and this, that, and the other. And we had an airstrip built in front of us um, so that the Air Force could land there um, and put their helicopters and or light aircraft there. Nothing very big, but it was a dirt strip. And we used to have to travel up and down that that um, that airstrip as uh, mine detectors. So obviously a policeman's life was not that important compared to an air force aircraft <laughs> so when they would say we, we're 30 minutes out um we're gonna land at mzarabani okay go and check the 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 airstrip so we had to drive up and down that and explode any landmines that had been planted there fortunately we never had that but one day we heard this massive explosion and uh, it was not far from us and um what had happened was the two terrorists had attempted to plant a landmine and um, they had accidentally detonated this thing. Uh, we didn't know that. We went down to investigate the explosion the next morning because it's not a good idea to go down there at nighttime. So we went in the first light the next morning, and there was this huge hole, and um, we couldn't find anything except this strange smell. And then all in the tree around us was this um, the remains, if you like, of these two terrorists. We found two buckled and bent weapons, and that showed how many people were there. And uh, that tree from there on became called the Biltong tree, which was basically like beef jerky. <laughs> it was horrible. But that was one of the things that took place there. We we had other instances of um, attack down there. Uh, sometimes we called in the army on tracks um, and all the police, the uh, anti-terrorist unit, the Patu, uh, on tracks on various things. And we had a number of contacts in that area, but nothing really, very heavy. I remember one time when we were there, um, we had deployed um, the police anti-terrorist unit on tracks with Sam, the, the tracker, and they had located the, the terrorists quite close by, so they asked us to support them in any way we could. And we had a, a local farmer there called Les Jellico, just by chance, he, he had his aircraft there and uh, he was visiting. And um, so we took off, he and I took off, and um, we flew around that area, and every time we went down, there were very, very, very thick trees so we had to come in at an angle so that you could see underneath there to see if we could locate these these guys and give advice to the the positioned uh, party group. And, um, you know, when you're in an aircraft, you don't know if you're getting shot at, but we had a call from the, the leader of the party group saying, by the way, um, uh, why have you got an engine problem? Um, we said, we haven't got an engine problem. And so we didn't think about it and then turned – came back for another run and this the guy said as you're coming down you seem to have a, a problem with your engine it keeps on going pop, 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 like this we said it's running fine and we'd only then realized that this whole group had opened fire at us we didn't know that we'd been uh, um, fired at because you won't know that until you actually hear the rounds <laughs> going through the aircraft <laughs> so yeah so things like that but yeah there was it was quite an active time but it was time for me to leave um i'd been down in there and they they say you to go bush happy you know in, in a place like that <laughs> So, so what, was um, your, what was your next posting, Keith? So what happened was that um, uh, I just wanted to just 
tell you very quickly that that Zambezi Valley at that time was wild. A lot of elephants, a lot of lions, lots of stories relating to that type of thing. Um, many of the the soldiers that operated in that area will also remember the heat and the the, the animals that would walk in, into their camps. <laughs> mm. So anyway, um, t- uh, I was um, moved from that area and uh, from Centenary basically, and uh, moved towards a town called Bundura, which is northeast of uh, of Salisbury. And uh, then I was um, asked to join a group which is called Special Investigations Section. SIS for short. Um, it's got nothing to do with the SA. It's, it's a police operation. And basically, special investigations section was an idea to increase the um, reaction ability of a gather, police gathering uh, ability uh, in particular areas. And um, I wasn't the first in the in that type of th- operation. Um, we did some training. So we set up um, an SIS group in Bandura which was basically five men, myself, one sergeant being black, and then three to four uh, black constables. But we had to go and do training, um, advanced training. And we met up with another group that came from a Toka area, also SIS, uh, under the leadership of a guy called Rob Parker, who became a legend. Um, he was so good at his job uh, in SIS. Anyway, so we trained uh, for a period of time in uh, Mazoe, which was a little bit towards uh, Salisbury. And um, then I got, we got our deployments. So our deployment was primarily controlled by Special Branch. And Special Branch, with Colin Evans and Phil Hartlebury and a very nice gentleman told, called Tony Granger, uh, were basically my boss. And um, they would deploy us on information gathered uh, in the Bandura area. And it could range from the various tribal trust lands where many um, local people, like black people, lived right through to the farming areas to the, the, the vast place. So if they got information from an informer um, being special branch, they would then, instead of calling in the army and wasting resources, if you like, from their side and calling in um, expensive, if you like, um, military action, they had a local team, which was us, called the SIS. And so they would deploy us um, to react to this information. So we became the lo- local busybody um, running around trying to find um, these groups of, of insurgents, both in the tribal trust lands and in the farming area. And we had a lot of action. Um, on a daily basis, we were called on on operations to go here, there, and everywhere. But So we operated, eventually it came down to a four-man stick. We operated as normal troops. In other words, uh, in our Rhodesian camouflage with um, FN rifles. Uh, but at a particular stage, it became evident that it may be um, opportune time to actually go pseudo. So in other words, to gather information um, and and get more um, more results by going um, to pretend to be the enemy. So our little group uh, went through some training and we were deployed primarily in the Marewa area, north of Shamba, um, Furudzi Game Reserve area, wildlife area, um, um, Sana t- tribal trust land and so on, Chueshi, uh, as pseudo terrorists. So we did a lot of work. Uh, about seventy-five percent of our work was uh, pseudo operations. And again, we 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 actually did succeed a lot more because we were getting a lot more information. So whenever we went into an area, we were uh, told to operate as um, as pseudos, but in a frozen area. Now, a frozen area would be dictated by um, the military and or by special branch. Um, if it was military, it would be Salus Scouts operations. If it was by special branch, it would be us. Um, so no no military operations were to take place in that, that area because we were dressed as terrorists. And if we were, we were seen, we would have been shot. So nobody was allowed to go into that area. Um, and only police... Um, were allowed to go in that area of, to visit and handle crime, but they had to remain on the main roads and all auxiliary roads. They weren't allowed to go into the bush. So that's what we did. And uh, um, we did rather well. We had um, in my book that it ex- expands a lot about the um, the SIS operations in pseudo thing. One of the things that was really funny was um, Colin Evans had come up. One of his informers actually turned, turned out to be a double agent um, had said that there was a, um, 
a group of um, insurgents in the area, and um, but he was concerned because he thought that they um, had detected that he was in fact a double uh, agent. So he was concerned that they were going to come and murder him. Anyway, so Colin said to us, um, dress up as terrorists, go in there, grab him, pull him out, and um, we'll put him into a safe place. Save him, basically. So we were in terrorist um, gear and with our AKs and all the right stuff. We had to you know, penetrate a, a protected village, which was defended by guard force and in, internal affairs people. So how are you going to do that? So we had to, um, we shot out the some of the, the large lights which were around there with a silenced tutu rifle which uh, we had borrowed, shot them out, and then uh, it was dark where we could go through. Then we cut our way through the, the fence and then uh, entered that, that protected village, located the, the hut um, which we had to go to and then broke through into that. Um, but when we broke in there, uh, we didn't know that there was going to be like 14 people in the hut and it's pitch black. So Musa and I broke into the hut, crashed the door down through in it and basically to grab this guy. And we fell over all these sleeping people. And of course, everybody was shouting murder, murder, and you know, this, that, and the other. So we grabbed this guy and, and had to um, pull him out. And everybody was running around with sticks and things to kill us, you know? So <laughs> we had to run. We grabbed this guy and, um, uh, but fortunately the, um, the protected forces of the keep, they didn't react. Um, Although there was a lot of noise, there was no firing, but there was a lot of noise going on. Everybody was wanting to kill us. So we had to run away. But I got snagged on the way out through in the fence. And um, But Musa had to come back and grab me and help me get out. And then, because they were after us, the local people were going to kill us because they thought that we were a terrorist group. And um, so, yeah, we managed to escape. But um, eventually uh, that chap um, was removed from there, and uh, we basically saved his life. So um, that's what happened. So it was an interesting story. <laughs> Keith, there was an incident with a farmer being killed. Um, yeah. Just, just, just talk us. Yeah, we that. got information. There, on the eastern side uh, of Shamba area, a farmer there. Um, it's the only time I really was very badly affected by the the war. Um, I cried for days. Anyway. Um, what had happened was that a group of 21 insurgents had come to the farm and because this farmer and his wife were so far away from anybody, they expected to get some assistance from the farmer. If you don't tell the security forces that we are here, we will not harm you. So they um, met with the farmer during the daytime and they gave him a warning. They said, if you tell the security forces that we are here, we are going to kill you. And um, they then... Um, were around, but of course the farmer being diligent and uh, trying to have the right um, way to handle these guys came and reported the the incident to special branch, uh, Colin Evans and Phil Hartlebury. And uh, so we were tasked to go and um, locate this group. So we went down there. At this particular time, I had just been um, given a um, and trained in the use of a passive night observer a, a scope, which goes onto a, an FN rifle. Uh, I put it onto a heavy barrel rifle initially, but it was too heavy to carry around. So I could observe um, at night uh, what was going on. So we used that. Um, there were only 26 ever issued, as I understood, to the police. Uh, I was very fortunate to have been given uh, the use of one of those for a year. Um, and because of my position as being a reaction, if you like, in the Bandura area, they thought it was useful for me, which it was. It actually helped us a great deal. And um, so we we located into that area for a good period of time to try and find this, this group. We would use observation posts, um, try and check for tracks, um, look at uh, things. We would not interact with the locals because we did not want the locals to know that we were there. And um, we we stayed very well hidden. Um, and then at night, we would go down and we would try and find um, more information using the night scope and see whether or not we could find the, these, these terrorists, which, in fact, we did. Um, I remember the moon actually saved my life. It, um, it was behind the trees. And uh, the scope would work very, very well with the, uh, with the moonlight because it was a passive night observer. It was not an infrared. 
So if the moon came up, we would time our approach to the uh, the local area just right for the for us to be in position, uh, for the moon to come up, then we'd be able to see very, very well. And as that came up, we found that we were literally five, six meters from the corner of the the, the security fence of the local farmer's uh, compound. And um, right in front of us was this five or six of these insurgents. And um, we were so close that they actually could he almost hear us breathing. Um, so we um, we had to um, to make a plan. Two of those insurgents started to walk towards us. So I had to make a decision. Uh, we didn't want to have a contact, but we had to now because we were compromised in a way. So um, we, uh, I located the guy who I thought may be the most senior with a machine gun and an RPD, and I let him have it with the with the um, first round. So that's where the the word uh, f the words for my book came from. Watch my tracer, because um, the other guys would be told not to open fire because if you open fire with an eye scope, you get blinded by the the tracer and by the flashes. So I would fire first and try and get best kill possible and then they would open up having been told where to, to shoot so watch my tracer was what I would say to them and they would then know where to shoot so um, we opened fire and um, it was quite heavy um, and I remember firing I've never seen this before. again I saw a hat in mid air <laughs> and no person below it that's how fast they moved anyway the next day um we had now compromised this thing. We were in trouble because now we had made contact with these these terrorists. So what are we going to do about it? So we had to call in a dog section. We were going to be on tracks. We're going to get this group now. We're going to have to annihilate the entire group. So a group of, um, um, of police dog uh, tracker and dog killer. One the killer was an Alsatian, and the um, tracker was a young bloodhound called Sally. And we were on the tracks the next morning, first light. We dumped all our kit. All we took was radios, water, and as much ammunition as we could. And we set off for on tracks. Now, these guys that we were following had had the advantage of the full night to get away from us. But they they went very, very far. Um, they went into the Umfurudzi wildlife area, um, and we were on these tracks. Unfortunately for the dogs, there'd been a fire there before, so they were sniffing um, burnt ash, if you like, uh, all the way. They really worked hard. We came across, they'd obviously seen us coming. They left all their packs. I said to the uh, our little team plus the, the, the dogs, I said, let's carry on. Don't worry about the packs. Let's carry on. We'll catch these guys before the sun goes down. We'd been on tracks the entire day. Um, everybody was exhausted. We were running out of water. But we got to a particular little bit of valley, and um, I, I always was behind Musa. Musa was my lead man in the stick when we walked, and um, he was just behind the killer dog, uh, and the uh, the tracker dog was in front of him. And uh, suddenly there was all hell broke loose, and the noise was phenomenal. And um, we contacted some of this group in this this valley. Uh, the rocks, huge rocks, and the fire was intense. Um, it was over so fast, I didn't even have a time to, to fire my weapon. Uh, Musa was flat out. He was right in the middle of it. Um, and he, um, when I got there, I think he must have pumped 50 rounds into this one machine gunner uh, that was there. It was right right close to him. He must have got such a fright. Anyway, um, at that particular time, we, um, we had to move out um, because it was running late now. And the killer dog disappeared. He just ran away. The fire was so intense. Uh, he ran away. But the bloodhound, little Sally, the seven-month-old, she lay right next to her controller and stayed there as as commanded. And they, she was remarkable. We did eventually find that that killer dog uh, about a week later. He pitched up at a farm. But, uh, yeah, that was an interesting time. The only time that I worked with uh, with dogs on tracks. And then, uh, Keith, the sad part, you, you're in the bar. And the news comes through. Now, having had this firefight with these um, this group, um, now it was a real problem. We had to literally take them out. So we had the first contact with them, and then later a second one, which we managed to to knock a couple off. But some of the rest were still alive. So, uh, but we were very very active in that area, trying to get them down. Uh, but eventually, we 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 lost them. We thought that they'd moved. So we, I went on leave for a week. Went into town, uh, Salisbury, and to go and drink 
myself to death as normal. And um, I heard the news that this farmer had, had been killed. Um, the terrorists had lived up to their promise that they were going to come back and, and kill him. And they came back and they killed him. And it's the that's what made me, um, for three, four days, I had sobbed my heart out for this man. Family. Yeah. Shame you don't want to mention his name, Keith. I don't. No. Oh, okay. Okay. No. No. All right. We'll yeah. What happened? <laughs> I'd finished my uh, three years by this stage um, of police. So I decided uh, I'm going to go farming. There's no point in going to join the game department because the war was full on. And uh, so I'm going to go farming. So I went to become a uh, assistant manager at a very, very big farm in Norton. After three months, I realized that, in fact, it was not for me. And I had to get back into the um, into the military, into the war. So I went to volunteer. But I was sitting in a bar in Manamatapa Hotel and drinking with a bunch of characters, knowing that I had to go for an interview to be reinstated into the police at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with a senior assistant commissioner. And um, and then across the, the radio uh, came the news that a number of our friends had been killed in a in a battle and um of course we had to toast to them so we we drank heavily and um when i got to the um senior assistant commissioner uh, to rejoin um i was absolutely legless and i had to explain my position to him and fortunately he took he realized what was that and he gracefully said right it's fine but don't do it again so I rejoined um, the police force, and um, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. So they put me through a, an intense radio training course where I did a lot of um, work with radios to um, to repair and or to learn how to operate radios, TR-48s, 38s, and so on, all the different radios that we had. Um, and then um, I was one day called, and um, they said, I need to go and join a group um, – in special branch um, in Bandura. So I went merrily down there. And this was a group um, which was based at a farm called Retreat uh, in the northern part farming area of Bandura, uh, run by a chap called Dougie Tapson, his farm, basically. Very strong guy. He had actually been part of um, the group that was there um, that supported us. So this particular special branch group that was running uh, a training section in in the Bandura area on Retreat Farm was the overflow from this SAS, basically the initial training of the Fumarovanu, or Spear of the Nation. This was when Bishop Musa Rewa had become Prime Minister uh, of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and we had grown up a locally trained, if you like, um, military unit based on his um, supporters. What was supposed to happen was that they were all supposed to be his group, or whether it's people that were in the bush now come back, joined the armed forces of Rhodesia under the Bishop Muzarewa banner because they were supporters, and then get trained by us and then go back and then fight on the government side. Now, at Retreat Farm, uh, we had about 500 um, recruits at any one time. And uh, there were a number of chaps there that uh, assisted us. Um, but most of these Fumo Ravano or um, auxiliaries, that there's, as they were called, were, were basically grabbed off the street and uh, given employment to come and join the military. And um, they weren't terrorists. They weren't um, oh. Bishop Musa. They were supporters necessarily. Mm -hmm. So we had to be very careful but but they were thrown into this lot, trained for a period of time, and then thrown out and given um, districts where they would operate. So in that group of special branch people we had, our leader was a, a very, very good operator called Ken Stewart. Um, and um, Ken Stewart was um, quite a, um, a cowboy, really. Some people didn't like the way that he operated, but he, he got the job done. Um, we worked very hard. Um, we also had... Ben Pretorius, he, he was there as second in command. And then we had uh, about 32 um, support staff um, that included people like Dennis Thomas, Tom, Thompson that used to make all those copper mm, plaques that I you used to buy yeah. in Rhodesia. Um, uh, Stoddart, he was a um, police um, weapons instructor. He helped us a lot on our training. 
And we also had um, other folks that supported us, um, Cedric Yonker and um, Nolan Payne, who used to make ponies, boats for um, those those fiberglass boats that you could buy to go in Lake Kariba, and a whole bunch of things. So 32 basic supported staff. Uh, and also along that was an ex Salu scout. Um, his name was Tians Ilov, and um, he he joined us, and um, he was quite uh, influential in helping us to understand explosives. So he taught us a lot about explosives and the training methods and this, that, and the other, and from the Sulu scout's point of view. But um, we'd done about uh, two intakes, about a 1,000 um, Fumo Ravano. Um, the initial group of Fumo Ravano were, were armed with AKs and SKSs, primarily SKSs, no machine guns, and it's civilian clothes, which were all um, bought with a slush fund um, under Mac McGuinness from the Sulu Scouts um, attachment special branch. Um, so that fund funded all this civilian clothing that the uh, former Ravana were wearing. And with all the, the weapons were obviously being captured and um, scraped around to, to arm them. Um, but at a later stage, they were all then changed into brown uniform Mm -hmm. uh, with a logo and given some identity. And they were issued with G3 um, German made rifles, which also fired the 762 by 51 NATO round. Uh, so all the AKs eventually got sent back. But in fact, we kept them as, uh, as our little unit. Mm 